Good morning, brethren, and uh, good morning to some, good afternoon to others, and to brothers from Europe, probably good evening. Our subject today will be the present evil world, and it is based on letter to Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 4. We will the, read the first portion of it. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That is a King James Version. Um, New American Standard, it says, present evil age. Uh, which one would be the correct one? Um, I guess the best way to, would be to interpolate between those two. World uh, means like, like an object. Age is like a period of time. So if you put an object in a period of time, so this object is in an evil period of time. In the future, this world could be in better situation. They might not be an evil, but presently it's called present evil world. What makes, what makes present world an evil one? Satan does and his angels. At one time, he was called Morning Star. In letter in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, he's described as a seal of perfection, perfect in beauty. So if they say beauty, he was perfect in it. He was anointed cherub. But at one time, his pride and overblown ego, he went too far. He wants to be even with God. So God dropped him down to earth. And now he is here doing everything to destroy whatever God's created. Whatever is associated with God, he will try to destroy that. So he corrupts the governments, corrupts the political systems, economical systems. He creates wars, revolutions, social upheaval. He tried to destroy humankind. But his number one target are Christians because they dedicate their lives to serve God. They consecrate themselves, they try to follow what God is saying through Bible to them. And he tries to destroy them. On the other hand, there are other group of people which are not associated with Bible pagans. He doesn't have to work with them. They will go wherever he asks them to go because they listen to him. Christian, they don't. And to prove that, you can, you can see that all around us. There's two major religious groups in the world, Christianity and Muslim, Christianity and Islam. There are some other ones like Buddhist and Hindu religions, but those are two major groups. And if we look at those two major groups, they got reference books. One is Koran, the other one is the Bible. Islam is directed by Koran. And there's two major groups there, Shia and Sunni. One book, Quran, two groups. The other one is Christianity. Bible, one book. And according to the web, there is 45,000 different denominations. 45,000 different denominations. So now you can see how he works. He doesn't work there. He works on Christianity. He tried to destroy them. I may bring another statistical number to your attention, which more underline how masterful is, is he in doing that work against God. In King James Version, when you look at the that Bible, there is around 31,100 verses. Let's see, 31,000, more than 31,000 verses. 
but there are 45,000 different denominations. So for every verse, there's way more denominations than verses in King James Version of the Bible. Isn't that amazing how he works? But that's where he concentrates. How can he work? He's invisible and he has such an influence on all the world and around us. Maybe to give you an example of invisible forces, we can look at the light and the sight. We can see because there's a light. If there's no light, we cannot see. So light, those are electromagnetic waves coming from sun or other source of light, lamps and flashlight. The, the light comes and hits the object and comes back to us, to our eyes, and then we can see different shapes, different colors. And if we put those electromagnetic waves into a spectrum, which could be like one meter long, and it starts, starts with those uh, very minimum waves like gamma rays, through X-rays, through ultraviolet, through visible spectrum, and then we get uh, infrared, and then after that microwave and the radio waves. So all those waves would be that one meter long, that spectrum. The visible light is only four to five centimeters long. So only a little portion is what we see. The rest we don't see it, but it's all around us. We can see people using cell phones. We can see people opening up the doors, uh, do they call it? garages. Uh, people are using GPS to guide the vehicles to the, their own destinations. We can see the satellites broadcasting them, movies, all kinds of programs down, down to earth. And vice versa, people can control those satellites through those waves. So those waves are intersecting us. We can go to a huge building with a concrete wall. We are down in the basement and we can hear the radio. The waves are coming right through concrete. So there are invisible force which moves things, things around. And that similar forces are using Satan to implant imagery in our mind. So through those imagery, he can tempt us. He can recreate such certain situation that were discomforted to us. He tries to influence our minds. He tried to drag us away from the Lord. And that is not new. Look at what happened to Jesus. After 40 days in the wilderness, now he's coming and out of the wilderness. And he's coming to start his mission. And as he walks, Satan approaches him and he's saying, look at there are rocks here, make a few buns out of it, maybe loaf of bread, refresh yourself. So you come to village, you can start your mission right away. But what did Jesus say? He quote the scripture. You won't live by the bread alone, but by every word coming from the Lord of mouth, the Lord's mouth. There's another temptation but we won't have time to explore that. But the third one, he put Jesus on a pedestal, of course, through imagery. On that pedestal, Jesus could see all the kingdoms, all the nations of the world. And now Satan is telling him, worship me and all of them are yours. Look at, you don't have to go from town to town on a dusty road, try to convert people to listen to you. All gonna be your subjects and they will do whatever you want them to do. Your mission will be accomplished in no time flat. Just worship me. But what did Jesus do? He quote the scripture again. God is the only one to be worshiped and served. So dear brethren, if we could use some lessons from it, if the temptations come, our escape is to the Bible. We have to know our Bible. We have to know those stories so we can use them in a time of need because we are living in the evil world.
Jesus pre predicted that, that that may happen, the temptations which come to Christians and so on. So when he gave the prayer, the, the Lord's prayer, then he put the phrase in it. Don't lead us into temptation. What does that phrase mean? It acknowledges our weaknesses in the face of temptations. And dear brethren, we are not immune to it. They come no matter what. We are not immune. They will come. But our escape is know the scripture and the prayer. Look at Apostle Peter. He barely escaped. So evil is creating all kinds of frictions in marriages, among the brothers, in congregations. Sometimes parents are set against teenagers, teenagers against parents. There are problems with gambling, gambling drugs, substance abuse. There are all kinds of problems and Satan will explore all of them given the chance. Satan, the prince of this world, is like a rolling lion looking for whom he may devour. So how can we defend ourselves? How can we defend ourselves? The answer is Bible. Bible is our weapon. It's a two-edged sword. Old and New Testament alike, we can use them. The stories from the Old Testament, stories from New Testament, there are promises, there are hopes given to Christians. So we can overcome those difficult times. So dear brethren, testimony meetings, fellowship with brethren may also help. And the most important is the Bible and the prayer. Those are of essence. And now dear brethren, as we journey through this evil world, I wish you all success in overcoming life obstacles and a safe passage to God's kingdom. May the Lord add his blessings. Thank you.